Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our webinar, Telehealth in School-Based Health Centers, Lessons Learned, and Best Practices from Early Adopters. Before we begin today's presentations, we have a few housekeeping items. Please help us count. If you're viewing this webinar as a group from a single computer, please enter the name of the person registered as well as the total number of additional people in the room. For example, Tammy Jones plus three. This will help us with our final attendance count. All attendees are in listen-only mode. However, we want to hear your questions today. To ask a question at any point during the webinar, please use the chat box that is located in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will hold all questions following the presentation. And if we are unable to address all questions on this afternoon's webinar, we'll follow up with everyone via email. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our School-Based Health Alliance website in three to five business days. Please also be sure to visit School-Based Health Alliance's website for additional archived webinars in the topics you see on your screen. And without further delay, I'd like to introduce John Schlitt, President of School-Based Health Alliance, to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Erin, and hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. We have a great program for you today. Before we dive in, and because we have audiences who might be unfamiliar with the Alliance and school-based health centers, I wanted to take just a few minutes to introduce our organization and the model. The School-Based Health Alliance is a national membership training and advocacy organization that gives voice and support to the school-based healthcare movement. We are healthcare practitioners, education leaders, youth, researchers, and policymakers all dedicated to a common sense idea of bringing health to children and adolescents where they learn and grow, their schools. The School-Based Health Alliance exists because we believe all children and teens deserve to thrive. We know we have proven solutions to solving the healthcare access gaps of young people today, and that the distribution of health in our nation need not be inequitable or unjust. We believe in the transformational power of the health and education intersection because, as so many of you on this call know today, healthy students make better learners. We know that for too many children today, they arrive in the classroom and in the hallways of schools carrying what we might look at as, 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 as baggage with them, the hunger, sickness, and homelessness as this cartoon so um, aptly depicts. Too, too often young people are walking into the classroom with these kinds of social determined uh, and, and uh, conditions in their lives that make them unavailable uh, to succeed in the classroom. Bringing health care into the schools helps address some of these complex issues. School-based health centers provide over 2 million children and adolescents today across the country with access to comprehensive, child-centered medical care, mental health services, preventive care, social services, and youth development in a setting that is trusted, familiar, and immediately accessible. School-based health centers function and thrive through partnerships with community health partners, such as federally qualified health centers and public health departments, hospitals, as well as schools and other community institutions. They serve at the intersection of primary care, mental health, public health, and education to ensure optimal health outcomes and academic success for students. The Alliance was delighted to see the HRSA Telehealth Network Grant Program, FOA, encourage rural school-based healthcare models for children and teens living in deep poverty. We also imagine that the concept might be unfamiliar to some prospective applicants, so we pulled together a terrific panel of highly qualified leaders to share their insights about their varied experiences in adapting health technology in school settings. Each brings a unique perspective and, I imagine, some shared common lessons. I thank them for their enthusiastic and swift response to our invitation, and let me introduce them very briefly now. Carlos Mena is Program Coordinator for the Telehealth Network and Rural Child Poverty Telehealth Network Grant Program and the Office for the Advancement of Telehealth in the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy at HRSA. 
He joined Harrison in 2005 and prior to that worked as a budget analyst at the former Walter Reed Army Medical Center here in Washington, D.C. Mr. Mano holds a Master's of Science degree in Healthcare Administration from the University of Maryland. Steve North is the Founder and Medical Director of the Center for Rural Health Innovation, which is the subject of his presentation today. Steve is a family and adolescent medicine doc who sees patients three days a week. He's also the Medical Director for the Mission Center for Telehealth and an Adjunct Assistant Professor and Co-Director of the North Carolina Multidisciplinary Adolescent Research Consortium and Coalition for Health at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine at Chapel Hill. Kari Collins is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Director of Mental Health Services in the School Health Program at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. Kari has extensive experience organizing and implementing evidence-based mental health treatments in school clinic settings, including individual and group treatment for trauma, and most recently, a curriculum for substance use. Kari's clinical interests include application of mindfulness techniques to mental health treatment, the classroom, and overall school environment. And last is Tammy Greenwell, the Chief Operations Officer for Blue Ridge Community Health Services, Inc., a nonprofit federally qualified health center in North Carolina with 12 practice sites covering primary care, obstetrics, and gynecology, pediatric, psychiatry, and behavioral health, pharmacy, dentistry, nutrition services, and four school-based health centers. Tammy holds a Master's of Public Health and Administration and Bachelor of Science in Nursing. So that is your esteemed panel. I'm now going to turn it over to Carlos, who's going to provide a brief overview of the FOA um, that was recently announced and that uh, precipitated this uh, conversation today. So, Carlos, take it away. Thank you kindly, John. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yes, my name is Carlos Mena. I'm the program coordinator for the Telehealth Network Grant Program, and I'm going to highlight some uh, very key uh, points uh, with respect to this grant program um, with the encouragement of supporting rural school-based health centers. So without further ado, uh, I'll be discussing the Telehealth Network Grant Program in detail and reviewing key items like I mentioned. Next slide, please. I'll review the purpose and background of the Telehealth Network Grant Program. I'll also discuss each of the FOA's major sections that include eligibility, narrative, attachments, criterion, performance measures, funding preferences, and funding priorities. Next slide, please. And the purpose of this Telehealth Network Grant Program is to demonstrate how telehealth networks are used to A, expand access to, coordinate, and improve the quality of healthcare services, B, improve and expand the training of healthcare providers, and or C, expand and improve the quality of health information available to healthcare providers and patients and their families for decision making. As I mentioned earlier in particular, we do wish to encourage telehealth services delivered through school-based health centers uh, particularly those serving high poverty populations. It's important to note that this funding opportunity seeks to support very established telehealth networks that have many patients currently enrolled in the applicant's respective telehealth network program with many committed originating site partners, has a strong record for the telehealth program in terms of metrics and evaluation data that is evidenced in the narrative section, and that the applicant adequately ensures that committed partners are ready to fully begin their proposed project on September 1, 2016. For this purpose, grant funds can be used to expand the number of rural originating sites and or expand the clinical services being delivered to the applicant's telehealth network's rural originating site. And as indicated throughout the FOA, we do encourage such established telehealth networks to partner with school-based health centers, particularly in rural areas, either in their respective state or region. Applicants can be eligible to receive funding priority points, as will be discussed at the end of my, my presentation. However, applicants may elect to pursue a different proposal not inclusive of school-based health centers but would not be eligible to receive funding priority points. Next slide, please. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, was there one skip? I'm sorry, was there one on the definition of school based? Okay, thank you. And as the audience here is well aware of, this, of a, what a school based health center, I'm sure, is, is composed of, 
Um, it is important to note that primary health care services must be provided by a licensed health, health care professional to children. In essence, all the committed telehealth partner sites should work together to offer comprehensive care services, and that is types of services commonly, commonly offered in a clinic. In addition, the school-based health center or any originating site committed to the proposed project must be a nonprofit entity that is in a rural area in order to receive grant support. Applicants are strongly encouraged to provide telehealth services for rural children that focus on asthma, obesity reduction and prevention, behavioral health, diabetes, and oral health. Next slide, please. Up to 20 grants will be awarded, and an applicant can request up to $300,000 per year for up to a four-year project period that ends on August 31, 2020. Please note that a maximum of 40% of the requested amount per year can be used to purchase equipment and that a maximum rate of 15% per year can be applied to the indirect cost rate. Indirect cost rate agreements with HHS should be submitted as attachment 12 of your application. Next slide. In addition to what's shown on this slide, the eligible applicants include rural or urban nonprofit entities that will provide services through a telehealth network. Faith-based, community-based organizations and tribal organizations are eligible to apply and services must be provided to rural areas, although the applicant can't be located in an urban area. An eligible telehealth network is comprised of a network destination site that provides or facilitates healthcare and clinical human social services to a number of network partner rural originating sites. The applicant, organization, and network destination sites may be located in an urban or rural area, but telehealth network partner rural originating sites must be in rural areas as defined by HRSA in order to receive funds through this award. Urban, urban originating sites are not eligible to receive grant funding through this award. Next slide, please. And we'd also like to point out that in awarding grants, OAT will ensure to the greatest extent possible that grants are equitably distributed among the geographical regions of the United States, and OAT being the Office for Advancement of Telehealth. As a result, grants could be limited to one per state. Next slide. And if the applicant proposes to include school-based health center originating sites, then please include the number of rural school-based health centers to be supported through the project proposal under item D of the project abstract as outlined on page five of the funding opportunity announcement. Under item E of the proposed of the project abstract, we do request that the applicant list the clinical services to be provided. If the proposal includes supporting school-based health centers, then please indicate under item E which of the following services would be provided to those school-based health centers, those being asthma, obesity, reduction in prevention, behavioral health, diabetes, and oral, oral health, as outlined on page one of the funding opportunity announcement. A thorough description of an applicant's strong telehealth network's track record and background, along with the applicant's proposed project, will greatly assist the objective review committee's analysis of the application. Next slide. The first attachment will help to confirm that each of your committed network partner originating sites are rural. And please remember that only rural originating sites are eligible to receive grant support, not urban. And under attachment four entitled Network ID Information, listed on page 14 of the FOA, please be sure to include the national provider identifier and primary taxonomy if the site bills for service. If the site name or address do not match the NPI registration, please explain the health care provider number if the site receives universal service funding. Also indicate whether this, this is a currently active or new destination or originating site. And memorandum of agreements are very important, so please be sure to include your application signed and dated MOAs from committed partners that are ready to begin on September 1, 2016. Also, if you're a currently supported telehealth network grantee recipient intending to apply for this new competition, then you'll need to submit as attachment 13 your current telehealth network grant project abstract to ensure that the new scope proposal differs from previously funded activities for the purposes of the Objective Review Committee. Next slide. On pages 19 to 23 of the funding opportunity announcement, you will find the critical indicators that have been developed for each review criterion 
to assist the applicant in presenting pertinent information related to the criterion and to provide the reviewer with a standard for evaluation. Please read all of the indicators carefully. Next slide. And this helpful table can be found on page 9 and it provides a crosswalk between the narrative language and where each section falls within the review criteria. Next slide. Okay, the last of the three items that I, I want to talk about are number one being the performance measures in which recipients will be required to report on new measures that take into account the types of telehealth network partner settings, number of encounters by specialty service, patient care setting, and by type of telemedicine encounter, third party and grant reimbursement received for the encounters, new services available in rural areas due to the grant, patient and practitioner travel miles saved by each network facility, and number of practitioner referrals at each network facility. Data collection from each of the new recipients supported grant projects will begin in March of 2017, and we intend to publish a Federal Register notice regarding the new measures later this year. Next slide. And in order to meet a funding preference, we ask that the applicant note at least one of these funding preferences under item A of your project abstract attachment for the Objector Review Committee to note. And also note them in attachment 10 as outlined in the funding opportunity announcement. Next slide. And so I also want to talk about the funding priorities that I mentioned earlier. We have added funding priorities to encourage established telehealth networks to partner with and deliver clinical services using telehealth as a tool to rural school-based health centers. A funding priority is defined as a favorable adjustment of review scores when applications meet specified criteria. Applicants do not need to request funding priorities. Prior to final funding decisions, HRSA will assess all TGP applications within fundable range for eligibility to receive priority point adjustments. Applications are eligible to receive up to 15 priority points if the following conditions are met as noted on the slide. And I also want to note that funding priority points are not guaranteed and will be at the discretion of HRSA based on defined criteria that will be applied to all eligible applications after the object, the object review reviews occur. And last slide. And friendly reminder, due, date due dates for these applications under this funding opportunity announcement is Friday, April 8, 2016 at 11.59 Eastern Time. And I think we're going to hold off for questions at the end. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for listening. Thank you, you Carlos. You, uh, appreciate that. And yes, we are going to um, take questions at the end. But with that backdrop, I'd like to uh, turn the baton over to Dr. Steve North. Uh, we'll hear from uh, three pa panelists who will describe how they have successfully used um, technology to bring health services into schools. So, uh, Dr. North, take it away. Thanks, John. I appreciate that and appreciate the chance to be here and talk about our program, which is the Healthy Schools Program. Um, this is B-Log Elementary School. It is located up Highway 19W and has 60 kids. Uh, in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains in western North Carolina. We have had a telemedicine unit here for about four years, providing uh, primary care services um, back to our family nurse practitioner. And our program has been in existence for five years. We started with three schools in Mitchell and Yancey counties. We just added our last, uh, an additional school last week when we brought on the um, early college high school in McDowell County. We are primarily rural network and we cover about an area about the size of the state of Rhode Island as far as patient care. Um, all of the areas that we serve are HIPSA areas and all of our elementary and middle schools are Title I schools. So our program has been growing um, over time and we have had lots of experience with growing pains and building relationships with school systems. Two of the key takeaways that we've learned are that you need to have someone in the county where the program is so that you can be a part of that community. And so in each of our four counties, we have a full-time program director who is 
doing everything from enrollments to publicity and engaging with the local medical community. Additionally, um, we have an executive director and we have a full-time family nurse practitioner. This is something that we found was essential our, and through our initial funding streams when we were a small network with three and then ten sites. In our first two years, we had a part-time uh, practitioner and that resulted in us only being able to see kids if they happen to be sick on Tuesday morning. And of course, everyone is sick on Wednesday afternoon. So we've experienced some really strong growth over the years. So our main focus is primary care services um, and screenings for BMI, blood pressure. Um, I think that there are a variety of questions that come up in people's minds as we talk about school-based healthcare. One of the first things people jump to is peripherals. And well, what's your equipment like? Um, my colleague Amanda Martin and I consult on school-based telemedicine and rural uh, telemedicine implementation through our partnership with the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. And honestly, peripherals are one of the last things that you probably need to think about. But they're toys, and uh, I like computer toys, so people want to talk about them. Um, really, the thing that you need to focus on initially is developing relationships and your operational workflow. How are you going to do everything from getting a kid to your office uh, to be seen, and how are you going to communicate back with the parents, the primary care provider? How do you draw that parent into the visit? One of the other questions we get is, well, we would like a list of uh, conditions that you treat. And we have very clearly said we, will, we don't have a list. The reason behind that is that our school nurses are excellent partners, and we would not be able to operate this without their collaboration. However, if we had a list of 20 conditions that we treated, and a child presented uh, with one of those, with, with something that didn't quite fit that list, we now are almost placing our nurse in the condition of diagnosing as opposed to assessing. And so we don't want to have an established list. There's def there are definitely things that are not suitable for telemedicine. One of the questions we often get is, well, what, what happens when Janie falls on the monkey bar and breaks her arm? Well, you use the emergency plans that you've always had in place because we cannot treat that via telemedicine. So as we have grown, we have had more and more opportunities to work with primary care colleagues. I'm also a primary care provider in the community uh, where we started. And this is a great opportunity. It's also an ongoing challenge, as it is in all of school-based healthcare. One of the keys is for me to be able to call a primary care provider, have our family nurse practitioner be known in the 40 primary care offices in our region so that when she calls with a concern about a provider or an interest in, in working on a follow-up visit, she is seen as, as part of the medical community. We're still working to get there in every practice. And some of the practices we probably won't ever have that kind of a relationship with. One of the keys to what we, we do is that in our rural community, if kids are sick, they go home. Prior to our being there, there, there was no real opportunity to, to have kids stay at school. Um, if you need to see a doctor, you even, even might miss school for the day. What we have seen is that of the children that we've seen, about 75% of them stay in school that day. They don't go home. They return to class. And that's a really important number when talking with school systems um, about our, our work. Having a family nurse practitioner, we're also able to see teachers and staff members. That's been a great advantage for the school system. And frankly, it reimburses quite well for our program. So one of the keys is the telehealth presenter. And that's the person who's at the originating site or at the school presenting the patient. Uh, as you can see, this child's looking at a pretty standard telemedicine cart. There's a, we have an otoscope, a general exam camera, and a stethoscope that all connect into our um, software package. And our school nurses have been trained um, on a small group or individual basis to present patients. The equipment's quite easy. Um, we have connectivity issues, just like 
everybody does, whether it be with a WebEx or your cable at home. But the troubleshooting we're able to handle with our program directors on our end, and so we really try to minimize the need of the school nurses to perform those services. There are standardized programs for being trained to be a telehealth presenter. Um, some are free and online, and others are um, <clears throat> quite expensive and half-day courses that you may need to travel for. But the key, I think, is that you need to have a HIPAA agreement with the nurse. You also need to have a business associates agreement so that you can share some of the, the data in your electronic health record. As you think about your presenter, you think about other licensed people, other licensed healthcare providers at the school and, and how you can use them and in what setting. So is the gym teacher also an EMT? Could they be your telehealth presenter? Or if you're doing only mental health visits, does the guidance counselor or social worker sit in? Also thinking about how long does that person need to be in the room for the visit? Uh, the patient that I saw this morning you know, the school nurse started the visit and left. It was a behavioral health visit, and there really wasn't a need for the school nurse to sit in on that entire visit. At that site, we're quite fortunate that we have a completely separate room outside of the nurse's office, as opposed to having just the nurse's office with the cart. So she can continue to work on other responsibilities while we are seeing patients. So the barrier, the, the challenges and the overlap from between school-based health centers and school nurses has been very nicely summarized in this slide developed jointly by the National Association of School Nurses and uh, NASBEC, which is the former name of this fine organization. Um, but, you know, it's important that we look and, and respect that the school nurses have a variety of other responsibilities, and we are asking them to, to take on something more that they may not uh, either feel comfortable with or see within the scope of their, their practice. I know of a school-based telemedicine program that um, is no longer running, that this relationship was not developed very well, and the nurses pushed back, and so it closed because they did not have presenters. Our school nurses are spending less than 10% of their time um, presenting telemedicine pro patients. And as we talk with one of our veteran school nurses, Yvonne Harding, she talks about this being an added tool that she has to care for, her, for the students. I would recommend that you take a look at this article from the Journal of School Nursing last year. Um, and it comes out in strong support of school nurses using telehealth. It also is a good review of the existing data, outcomes data, which is quite limited. So transitioning, one of the key parts of, the, of Carlos's presentation was the need to develop a memorandum of understanding. And you need this both so that you as the provider can have a, a, a clear set of what you're going to provide, but also having a clear set of expectations around what the school will provide. If there is one thing that we have learned, it is that it is essential to have a direct contact person in the school system's IT department. Many times the firewall will be changed and then your network is offline and no amount of troubleshooting by your vendor can help you figure that out. You need to, to talk to somebody in the school system. Um, lots of issues here to consider and I am not going to go through all of them other than uh, the, the need for space that is secure and HIPAA compliant is very important, and also that making sure that, that someone from your organization is engaged on the School Health Advisory um, Panel or School Health Advisory Council for the school system, the SHAC, shows that you're there to do more than just provide acute care and that you really want to be a part of improving the general health of the school system. Here is some contact information, and additionally, we um, did a webinar through the National Telehealth Resource Center about two weeks ago, and you can link to it there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. North. I'm now going to ask Dr. Kari Collins if she will uh, start her presentation on telepsychiatry in schools. Kari, take it away. 
Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's webinar. I hope that learning about our telepsychiatry initiative will be helpful. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our overall mental health program, and then I'll describe why and how our telepsychiatry program was set up. Next slide. The Montefiore School Health Program is quite large. In the Mental Health Division, we receive approximately 1,500 mental health referrals each academic year, academic year at our 23 sites. In our elementary health centers, a majority of referrals are for behavioral health concerns, attentional issues, ADHD, and academic problems. In our high schools, approximately 50% of our visits are for depression, most often long-standing dysthymic depression. However, we find that an underlying issue with the majority of our mental health patients at all ages is trauma, specifically complex trauma. Next slide. At mental health intake, we administer measures to assess the mental health issues, and a treatment plan is developed with the patient and parent that includes targeted behavioral goals. Individual group and or family therapy are available. Treatment is comprehensive and provided in close collaboration with our schools and our medical providers. However, sometimes talk therapy is not enough. Next slide. We identified the need for a psychopharmacology program at our Article 28 health centers very early in the development of the mental health program. Our mental health providers at the Article 28 health centers work in unison with the medical provider, often a pediatrician or nurse practitioner. When a mental health patient needed medication or a psychiatric assessment, in the past the only solution was to refer them for outside psychopharmacology services, which also unfortunately meant losing the case because outside mental health clinics were required to provide both the therapy and medication. And we needed a better solution. In 2003, we were able to add a part-time psychiatrist to our program. By delivering psychopharmacology services on site, we thought we would be able to keep a majority of our therapy cases in the health centers. With our psychiatrist, we tried several different models to deliver psychiatric assessment and medication management. At first, the psychiatrist traveled from site to site, doing both assessments and medication management. However, as we added sites and grew bigger and bigger, this model became unsustainable. We then tried to have her positioned at a central school-based site where patients and parents would travel from their home school to the psychiatrist school site. But we found that parents were often unable or unwilling to travel, and taking the children out of their school for these appointments seemed to defeat the purpose of the on-site school-based model. Next slide. Around 2007, as the American Academy for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry began to advocate for the training of PCPs in psychopharmacology, we also began to establish a psychiatric consultation model where our on-site medical providers would provide medication management in consultation with our psychiatrists to patients with ADHD and mild to moderate depression or anxiety. Most patients that needed an actual psychiatric assessment or had more severe psychiatric issues and or more complex medication needs would need to be referred out, but we felt that with the help of our medical providers, we could address a large part of the mental health patient's psychopharm needs in our school-based health centers. Next slide. Currently, a majority of our medical providers have received psychopharmacology training either through the CAP-PC training program or through the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and are prepared to deliver psychopharmacology services in our health centers. The CAP-PC program has been a great resource for our medical providers and also offers peer consultation as well as continued training opportunities. Next slide. In 2011, we began to consider how a telepsychiatry service would enhance our psychopharm program through psychiatric consultation and support for our providers and also accommodate those patients in need of psychiatric evaluation as part of the mental health treatment and or medication management. We felt there were many potential benefits for the new technology for both our patients and our staff. Next slide. And here's just a brief quote from the APA on the benefits of telepsychiatry. Next slide. 
Of course, we saw that the biggest benefit to a telepsychiatry program was that patients would not have to leave the health center for the psychiatric evaluation or to be prescribed psychiatric medication. Care could be easily coordinated on site via teletechnology and with our medical providers. In, at Montefiore, since our health, mental health providers participate in all of our telepsych evaluations, communication and informa information sharing would also be improved. There is also an ease of both referral and continued care because patients and families are comfortable with our health centers. They generally already receive services there, medical, dental, mental health, community health services, and are very familiar with our providers, sometimes for many years. Clinicians also do not have the challenge of trying to communicate with outside psychiatrists and mental health clinics to coordinate care, which can be very difficult. Compliance with appointments is also improved when patients and families receive services in a familiar and comfortable environment like the health center. Next slide. We officially launched our telepsychiatry program in spring 2015. I would say that the major challenges we've had have been related to technology. That's why it's very important to start with one to two pilot sites, learn from the experience, and then continue to build the service up. At this point in time, we are providing telepsychiatry consultation, support, and evaluation at all of our 21 Article 28 health centers. Our two Office of Mental Health Clinics are required to have on-site psychiatric coverage, and they don't participate in the service. The Article 28 sites receiving the telepsych service are called spoke sites, and the site that our psychiatrist is transmitting from is called the hub site. At least in New York State, it is required that the hub site be located in one of the Article 28 health centers. Next slide. Our telepsychiatry program currently serves multiple purposes. Our psychiatrist has monthly telecase consultation times arranged for all spoke sites and uses the time to review all existing psychopharmacology patients with the medical and mental health providers. Teleconsultation times are also an opportunity for medical and mental health providers to initiate discussions on challenging cases and the need for possible psychopharm intervention. The determination if the patient needs to actually be evaluated by the psychiatrist is made during these consultation sessions. Most evaluations are conducted with patients when they are, there are worrisome psychiatric symptoms involving, for example, concerns about reality testing or non-suicidal self-cutting behavior or where diagnostic clarification is needed in order for the medical provider to proceed with psychopharm medication. The telepsych service also provides a venue for didactic training opportunities for the medical and mental health providers. And lastly, we have found that using the teleservice for weekly mental health supervision has been extremely helpful. As our program has gotten larger and larger, our mental health supervisors have found a chance to travel on site to all health centers every week. Next slide. For those of you considering establishing a telepsychiatry program, one of the most critical steps in planning for the service is doing a needs assessment to determine how the technology can best serve your patients and staff. There are many possibilities for how teleservices can be used, but it is important to prioritize where you see it being most beneficial and in gathering information from your key stakeholders. This is essential to the process. Once you've determined what you will offer, communicating that to your school, parents, and patients is also key. Most people are very supportive, yet they're also very curious about the telepsych services. They will have questions. Where is the psychiatrist located? Will my therapist be with me during the evaluation? Will other people be able to see the evaluation? Is this going to be taped? So it's critical to anticipate all possible questions about the service, and development of your policies and procedures will help with this process. We took about two years to develop our telepsych policy, but at the time there were very few telemodels to base our program on. And now with the expansion of teleservices throughout the country, I think there are many more resources to use, and I'll share some of those at the end of the presentation. But most importantly, for patient telepsych services, you need to plan on a small-scale pilot prior to launching full implementation. Next slide. There are many things that you will have not anticipated. For us, setting up the optimal transmission was most challenging. 
Specifically, the bandwidth available at our health centers was not large enough to accommodate the software program initially selected by our IT staff. Also, when we transitioned to our current electronic medical record last fall, there were technology issues at many of the sites, that, such as freezing of the image, sound dropping out, and ultimately we had, we had to change to a different software program selected by the hospital that resolved the bandwidth and transmission concerns. Whatever software you do choose, obviously it must be HIPAA compliant and use an encrypted signal. Your organization should be able to help you with that selection. As you begin to plan for the service being implemented at your site, you will need to carefully assess the location of each spoke office. Privacy is a key feature to consider. There needs to be sound barriers, either through the use of sound machines or a headset and microphone. Each office needs to have a suitable layout that easily accommodates the patient, therapist, and family members. Your cameras need to be able to pan, tilt, and zoom. Please make sure that your software system allows you to do this. Some of them are very limited. The camera features also become important if the psychiatrist wants to closely observe a child as they draw or play. Also, at the onset of each session, both the hub and spoke sites should use the pan feature to show who is in the room so that everyone is aware of who is present. And don't forget about lighting and wall color. Light blue is often suggested as the best backdrop. It is also important to test your camera and audio features prior to each tele-evaluation so that you are prepared and there are not any delays due to equipment or transmission problems. Next slide. As you think through how you will set up your program, other areas to consider are your health center's operating certificate. There may be changes necessary to provide this new service. And you will also need to develop an informed consent document that explains all aspects of the service. Extra time will be needed at the first telepsychiatric session for review and signage of the document and to answer any questions patients and parents have about the service. Also, you need to consider if translation services are going to be necessary for the psychiatric evaluation. Here at Montefiore, we use a translation telephone service. It can be challenging to set up, and my best advice is testing the system beforehand so that delivery is smooth when the patient and parent are present. Other tips and points to consider are how will you measure how well the service is working? What areas do you need to improve? We develop both a patient, parent, and a provider satisfaction survey. It is important to not only know how it is working for the patients and the parents, but also how is it working for your providers. Lastly, how will you promote this new service? We have a telepsychiatry brochure in development, and we're discussing adding a description to our website. Since it's still a fairly new way to provide services, Supplying information, including pictures of how it is set up, is helpful for the patients, the parents, and explaining the service to your schools. Next slide. As promised, here are several resources that you might find helpful as you develop your program and train your providers in delivering teleservices. I especially recommend the American Telemedicine Association materials. They're very in-depth and uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. We appreciate that presentation. We're now going to go back to the um, beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains and ask Tammy Greenwell to uh, wrap up our presentation. Tammy. Thank you, John. Um, as John mentioned, I'm Tammy Greenwell. I'm with Blue Ridge Community Health Services, and we're a federally qualified health center in Western North Carolina. Next slide. Just to kind of give you an overview of um, what Blue Ridge is about and um, our uh, philosophy. Our mission is to provide quality health care that is accessible and affordable for all and to be an integrated health care home that can exceed customer expectations and have a team that's innovative and responsive to changes in health care with telemedicine and telehealth being part of that. Next slide. Um, at Blue Ridge we provide the communities we serve with um, you can keep clicking. <laughs> um, a health home for underserved people, improving public health, uh, reducing the burden on hospital emergency rooms, um, providing those needed services such as free immunizations for uninsured children, and really providing affordable care for the uninsured. 
We are able as an FQHC to offer, offer our services on a sliding scale uh, and we do that in our school-based health program as well. And we have a consumer majority board of directors which is a, a bit different in the fact that 51% of our board members are actual users of our services and we actually have uh, parents of school-based health center patients on our board of directors. So the consumer is always at the forefront of decisions that are made. And access to broader health insurance coverage. The school-based health centers uh, help assist uninsured patients enroll in Medicaid, CHIP, and other assistance programs, um, including the healthcare marketplace for uh, children and or families that are uninsured. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so since 2009 at Blue Ridge Community Health Services, we've expanded school health services um, in the communities we serve by. First of all, we expanded our school health clinics. We had Apple Valley Middle School, which had been in existence since 1996. And um, in 2009, we added a high school, and then we we're also in two elementary schools. Um, and all of those sites offer comprehensive services, and meaning that there are staff on site providing behavioral health, medical through a mid-level, um, so a nurse practitioner or a PA, uh, nursing services, nutrition, and health education. Uh, we also have linked schools, so these are schools that are linked to those existing school-based health center sites, and the students and faculty and actually their families can be seen at those locations as well. Um, and then we have telecounseling. So we have six additional schools that receive telecounseling services, and those are the remaining middle schools, high schools, and alternative schools uh, that are not currently serviced by a school-based health center site in Henderson County. So it's in one specific county, not in several counties. Next slide. So to talk about specifically about our telehealth counseling program within the school-based health center program, um, the project serves students in middle schools, high schools, and the alternative school that do not currently have a school-based health center program. And the, the way we came about, you know, why are we not doing medical services? Why are we not doing other things through telehealth? Um, when we talked to the schools and we talked to the principals and administration of the school system, they definitely identified behavioral health as a major issue um, and, and the lack of that. So we discussed how could we do that successfully. Um, we had already been doing telepsychiatry through our, um, our FQHC model. So it wasn't completely foreign to our uh, behavioral health department and the counselors and, and the uh, service providers. So uh, it seemed like a really good fit. Um, so our, our counselors that were located in the school-based health center sites, which is actually um, the hub, if you will, uh, the hub site, they use secure video conferencing technology to provide those counseling services to those remote sites uh, or to the spoken sites. So um, we accept referrals from school guidance counselors, uh, community medical providers, the parent or guardian, uh, student self-referrals. Uh, so referrals can be made to the program from many locations. Uh, permission for those services is combined with what we call a school health center permission and registration form which is a, a basically a front and back form that gives us a lot of information about the student as well as authorization from the parent or guardian to provide those services. Students are assessed for enrollment into the program with a minimum of at least one on-site visit from a behavioral health counselor where they complete an assessment, um, make sure that they have all the questions answered, have the permission form, everything in place. And you know, really talk with the student and determine if that is a if this is going to be a valid way to um, have the student participate in their care. And then all reoccurring sessions after that will occur through uh, secure video conferencing technology. And we show the students that from the very beginning. Um, we have someone at the hub site 
uh, who can show the student, you know, exactly what it's going to look like and, and kind of what it's going to feel like when they're in that session. And we currently have about 90 students that have used this method of delivery and um, have been very comfortable with it. Next slide. Just some of the first steps that we really had to go in, you know, into looking in were actually our own staff buy-in. Some of our counselors were very skeptical. Uh, they felt like telepsychiatry was fine to be, um, you know, delivered in that way, but they weren't so sure about counseling. Um, school administration and guidance counselor buy-in, uh, you know, not only for the service delivery, but that we could have secure locations within the schools for the equipment, uh, using the school for, you know, using their network for connectivity. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, behind the scenes work that had to happen. And then also student buy-in for service delivery. We purposefully chose middle schools and high schools because we felt like uh, students would be definitely into the media aspect of uh, that sort of service delivery for counseling services. Funding, initial, initial funding for the equipment was provided by HRSA through an ACA grant for the school-based health center. It was a capital program that was back in 2011. One of the things, and, and I believe Kari mentioned that just a minute ago, connectivity was a huge issue. Uh, we did not anticipate what a large issue that was going to be during our startup. And then also that the equipment and the software you use can quickly become outdated. So if you purchase the equipment and it's taking you a year, six months to a year to get the connectivity worked out, by that time you're already you know, behind a version and and how do you make sure that you're always current? And then ongoing funding support. Um, we get some support through patient revenue for billing and then also through grant funding to help sustain the program. Um, some ongoing challenges. That method of service delivery is not for every student. So really helping our counselors to be able to sell the service, if you will, to, um, to the student or to the, the parent. Uh, that it's a, it's a good way to provide services. And then when you have counselor staffing issues or turnover, you know, making sure that you don't have one or two counselors who are willing to provide the service, that you have everyone comfortable and, and willing to, to hop on and, and take care of that, that uh, visit. Uh, school administration changes, so when there are changes in the principal or, um, you know, they're not aware of the program or what has been going on, then you, you have to go in and make sure that they're comfortable and they understand what's happening. And then again, the cost for connectivity and the support of technology. Um, we've actually looked at even going into something such as an iPad uh, that has a HIPAA compliant app on it that we can provide the same service but at a much lower cost. So, you know, technology is constantly evolving and how do we stay ahead of that and uh, continue to support the, the program as it should be. And then being able to expand the service to include group sessions between schools, um, that has always been our, um, our goal is to take it from a one-to-one -one session to be able to have group sessions between middle schools, for example, for things like bullying or other things that are pertinent to that age group or to to that location. So those are things that we're looking to do in expanding our service. Uh, next slide. And that's it for me. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, thank you, Steve, Carlos, um, Kari. Uh, a couple of issues that are coming up from the questions that we wanted to um, let the participants know that we will be loading the slide deck today and a recording of this presentation on the School-Based Health Alliance website um, uh, in, in just a short time after this event. Uh, and we, we, can, we will notify the attendees when those materials are up. So, so those of you who are asking for the materials, you will uh, be able to download those. Um, we also had a, some very specific questions for Carlos about, their, uh, about an individual program's eligibility. I would ask if those folks um, direct those questions uh, directly to uh, Carlos and to the office there. Carlos, is there a, a, a preferred way that you'd have people communicate with you directly? Yes, sir. They can either email me at cmena, that's C-M as in Michael, E as in Edward, N as in Nancy, A as in Apple, cmena, one word, at hrsa 
www.hersa.gov, hersa.gov, and my phone number as well is 301-443-3198. Right. Thanks, Carlos. And we'll include that information on the on the slide so people have that. They can also find that on the FOA. I'm pretty certain of that. Just two quick questions, and then we'll we'll wrap up because we are short on time. Uh, and I will I will field these. Any of the panelists who would like to take them. One is how do you uh, obtain parent consent? Is it annually or per encounter? And the second is. Um, how do you exchange information and connect with the child's primary care provider if you aren't that provider? In other words, how do you avoid duplication of services if, um, by communicating with the um, other medical providers in that child's um, life or medical home? Uh, this is Steve North. We obtain uh, consent initially upon enrollment and then update the enrollment packet every year for changes in insurance, health status, uh, phone numbers, et cetera. As far as communicating with uh, local health care providers, we um, do not have a robust HIE uh, in our state in that several of the major players are not participating and therefore we are still using um, the great fax machine that the medical uh, industry continues to, to keep uh, supporting. So don't have a great solution there. Tammy or Kari, do you want to address either the enrollment issue, the consent issue, or the uh, information exchange in issue? Well, it must if you are, um, all patients need to be registered in the health centers, and that's a one-time registration. And then we fill out the informed consent forms for the telepsychiatry one time, and then that's it. And the PCP part, it's not so much of an issue for us here because we provide a lot of primary care services right in the health centers. Yeah, this is Tammy. My experience is similar to Kari's as far as the permission and registration. That's completed at the time of enrollment and then updated annually. Um, and as far as communication with the PCP, um, because we do a lot of the PCP for the students anyway, it's, it's kind of embedded in our EMR. But if we do have permission from the parent um, in order to release that information, we will share that, you know, we'll share our note with the PCP, but as Steve mentioned, it is still through the great, the great gray fax machine. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, we are at the bottom of the 30-minute um, hour, and so I want to uh, reiterate my thanks and appreciation to Carlos, to Kari, to Steve, and to Tammy. Thank you all for being part of of this informational webinar. I hope you are motivated and inspired to look at the more closely at that FOA. We really see this as a terrific opportunity to expand the breadth and depth of school-based health care, uh, school-based mental health access across the country, particularly in rural communities where uh, uh, children and adolescents are um, underserved. So, uh, Carlos, we thank you and HRSA for uh, this terrific opportunity and encourage all of you to, again, to check out the, the, uh, the FOA specifically um, and, and contact Carlos directly if you have questions about the, um, the FOA. The, uh, I want to just close to remind everybody that uh, the School-Based Health Alliance is a membership organization. We can't do these kinds of activities without our members. So if you're um, uh, interested, you can go to our uh, 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 website uh, to join. We have two, two kinds of membership and, and a lot of terrific benefits of being a member. And I want to close with uh, promoting our national school-based health care convention and rally this year will be in the Washington, D.C. area end of June. It's a terrific opportunity if you're new to this field to come uh, and learn. Uh, it is a three-day learning uh, and networking extravaganza. And it's one of the, it's one of the highlights of of, of, of my year in, in this field, and, and the registration is now open. So uh, we hope to see you um, in Arlington. Okay, a big thank you to all for giving an hour of your time today. Uh, we wish you uh, much success uh, with the application process. And, and there's our, uh, our uh, email address if you have any follow-up questions. We, we, for those questions we could not answer, we do have them logged and uh, we will get back to you if we have a specific answer for you on those from us or, our, or the presenters. So, and my thanks to Erin Ash for her uh, extraordinary assistance today. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Thank John. You. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Bye.